Well, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Thanks for being here. Thank you for those that are joining us uh, online watching. It is great, uh, great to be able uh, to be here today, enjoying a beautiful day. Had a great service at 930 and looking forward uh, to jumping into or continuing our series on Proverbs. And so last week, last week we talked about walking with wise people, walking with godly people, the people that we do life with um, and the people that we choose to be influenced by. Uh, those people are either going uh, to encourage us to become wise and godly people, or if we're following foolish people, they're going to lead us away from God. And so we want to make sure while we want to reach out and love everyone, we want to make sure that inner circle, the people that we're choosing to do life with, that we're allowing to influence us, we want to make sure that they're wise that they're wise people. So today we're talking about, though, how do we resolve conflict? Because even when we walk with like-minded, wise people, we are all sinners being sanctified, right? And so because of that, there's going to be conflict because none of us are above selfishness and pride. And so and we can be deceived. And so there's going to be conflict that comes up. And it's really, really important. This is a life skill that's, that we find you know, in, in Scripture, that God talks about how we need to deal with and resolve conflict. But it's an important, important life skill because if we don't, if we don't know how to deal with conflict, we're going to have a pretty miserable life. We're going to have a miserable life. If we're always fighting and we don't know how to deal with it, or, or if it's like some people choose to, well, they're just going to ignore or try to appease it. And then what happens is it just builds up and builds up and it's just, it's not addressing the elephant in the room. And so like, oh, well, there's, there's no big blow up. There's not this big argument. No, but there's issues that need to be addressed with people that we're not addressing. And so that's a miserable way to live as well. And so while there are, if we put these principles, these biblical principles that we're going to look at into play, yes, it will help us avoid conflict that we that would never really get started in the first place unnecessary conflict but also it's going to help us resolve the conflict when it comes but there's conflict in, in every area of our life in th those that are married there's conflict in your marriage right like you maybe found that out like on day one of marriage there's conflict in marriage and sometimes people think well i was never like that before i was married Oh, no, you were. <laughs> it just there wasn't a witness before, right? But it's just sometimes being in that relationship with people that we love and are closest to, it can sometimes reveal that, you know, we're selfish and we're prideful. We like to get our own way. And so there's conflict in marriage. There's conflict maybe in your extended family. Anybody have one? Don't, don't you know, raise your hand or shout out. But yeah, you have a difficult, difficult family. You know, where you get together and you know there's going to be drama. You know there's going to be conflict or at work. At work, maybe you're in a high competitive job and nothing wrong with competition, but, but maybe you find at work that's what's causing some of the conflict is just that, that people are self-centered and pushy and, and, uh, and maybe that's where the conflict is. Or maybe you work with a bum who doesn't do anything and that's part of the conflict. It's frustrating because people don't do what they're supposed to do. And so there's conflict. Maybe you have kids and you're experiencing that, you know, kids don't always get along, right? Like, they should, but they don't. Just like in a, in a family, as the children of God, sometimes we don't get along with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, it's not right. We should, but it just the reality is that we're in this fallen world, and so there's conflict. There's conflict. And so, again, we can choose. Do we just live with that conflict and always live in this state of fighting and always live in where, where there's constant turmoil? We're always walking on eggshells. Or do we try to ignore it? Do we try to ignore it or appease it? And, and then again, that might temporarily seem like it's working, but it's just building up and building up. And, and, and sometimes maybe you've experienced that with someone where eventually, man, they just go off on you. And it's like, what did I say? Where did that even come from? And, and, and the reality is it was just maybe years and years of building up of not addressing the elephant in the room. So we're going to talk today about how do we resolve conflict when it comes. So starting out, Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus said this. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be called the children of God in Matthew 5, 9. So he's saying this, this is a characteristic of people who are saved or believers, the children of God is, this is a characteristic of them. They're going to be peacemakers. Does it mean we always are at peace and we never have conflict? No, that's not what it's saying. But it's saying that, look, a characteristic or what should be a characteristic of people who are the children of God is that they're peacemakers. That they're peacemakers. So being a peacemaker, again, that doesn't mean we ignore conflict. And by the way, like I said last week, let me say this again. There is such thing as being a godly troublemaker sometimes. When you're standing for truth. When you're standing for righteousness. And you stand up and maybe there's people that don't like that. And maybe it is going to create some conflict. Well, that's the kind of conflict, hopefully, that we're willing to have. Because we're going to stand on God's word. And in, in, in if that means that it makes people angry again, let's be loving about it. But let's be firm. That we are not ashamed to be, be called followers of Christ. And that we're going to stand for truth and righteousness. Amen? Let's be willing to do that. But that's not the conflict we're talking about today. We're talking about the conflict that comes from our pride. The, the, the conflict that comes from our selfishness and not being able to get along in the relationships that we are doing, people that we are doing life with. So how do we resolve conflict? Number one, biblic, the, the biblical way to resolve conflict is this, deal with it personally, deal with it personally. So when that conflict comes in life, you have, you have um, you're, something against someone, they have something against you, go to them. And be the first one to go. Man, that's hard. Especially if you know that, that you're in the right. It's hard to be that one to make that first move. And so what do we do? Well, I'll apologize when they do. Or we'll resolve this when they're willing to come and make this right. But yet, many times it needs to be us to make that first move. Here's what Jesus said about it. Jesus said this, he says that if you are, so basically in the context of, if you're going to sacrifice, if you're going to make a sacrifice, and so it'd be the, not, not exactly the same, but it would be like almost equivalent to we're coming gathering as a church and how important that is to gather. And we don't like pass an offering play. We have an offering box in the back and you come and you're ready to put, put money in the offering box, but you remember, you remember that you have a conflict with someone that's unresolved. Jesus said this about it. He said it would be better before making that sacrifice to go and resolve that conflict first. Here's what he says in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 23. He says, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and then you remember that your brother has aught or a conflict against you, he says, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, and first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So he's like, it's more, as, as important as it is to gather and to come and to even walk in the doors when our church meets and hear the word of God taught and, 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 and sing praises to God and make a sacrifice. What's even more important is if you know there's a conflict that you have with someone, it's more important that you try to resolve that conflict than your sacrifice to God. That's pretty important. He, Jesus is putting a pretty high priority on the fact that we need to resolve conflict in our relationships. In Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 15, he says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, so if someone sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So he's saying, go directly to the person that there's an issue with. And make it just between you two. Now the next verse he's going to say, look, if they, don't hear, if they don't hear you, you're going to take two or three witnesses, right? But at first he's saying, go directly to the person. And if they hear you, or in other words, if it's resolved, man, you've gained a brother. You've, you, you've restored that relationship. And here's my fear that too often we are more willing, we are more willing to dissolve a relationship than we are to resolve conflict. And you know, there's times, there's times where we, we do need to dissolve 
a relationship. We talked about that last week, right? There's evil, there's foolish people that are, that are leading, that can lead us astray. And, and there's times where maybe, maybe someone's really toxic, really dangerous even to you physically, emotional. Like, I get it. There's times to dissolve a relationship. But again, we're talking about principle here, right? This is, this is principle, not that there's never any exception to where, where there's people that we need to walk away from. We do sometimes. But many times we're too quick, I think, to just let a relationship dissolve than we are to try to resolve the conflict. Jesus says this, go, go directly to the person that there's a fault with. Look, if they don't hear you, then there's a time you need to, in other words, if you don't resolve it, there's a time to bring someone with you to try to help be a mediator, to be a witness, um, you know, during this conversation. And so that's necessary sometimes, but first and foremost, go directly to the person. Why? Well, now we're going to be in, in Proverbs, but Proverbs talks about the danger of getting people involved in our conflict who aren't part of it. They're not part of the problem. And they're definitely not part of the solution. Proverbs says, don't get people involved in it that don't need to be involved. If they're not going to help resolve this, or they aren't someone that you, have, that you have an issue with, or that they have an issue with you, don't go trying to get everybody on your side. Don't try to go and, 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 and get to someone first and tell them the story so that they'll join your side against someone else. Proverbs warns us of the danger of that. It says this, it says that a talebearer or a gossip in uh, Proverbs uh, 26, 20 says, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. So where there is no talebearer, that's a gossip or someone that's lying. It says the strife ceases. So what's, what is that saying? It's saying that someone that's lying, that's gossiping, they're just adding wood onto that fire. They're just stoking that fire. Why? Because they're lying and they, they're, they don't even need to be involved in it. But yet there's people that try to escalate it who aren't even part of it. And he says, look, if there's no gossip, if there's no lying, if there's, no, there, there's none of that, the strife or the conflict stops. It stops. But when people get involved and jump and take sides, you know what happens? That conflict, conflict escalates. And you know, this is a really, really important principle too, even for those of us that have kids, to be able to teach them how to deal with conflict. As, as parents, as hard as it is, right, not to immediately jump on our kid's side. Now, once again, yes, there are evil people in the world and we need to make sure our kids know they can come to us and tell us things what, and, and, and make sure that that communication line is open. Amen. And we need to help them and protect them. But we also need to help them know how to deal with conflict, especially the older that they get. The older that they get, we need to teach them these things. And our job as parents is to settle emotions, not stir them up more, right? As hard as that can be sometimes. Why? Because if, if, we're, if we're partaking in just adding to this God, so we're, we're just throwing, we're throwing wood on the fire. Proverbs also warns us this. It says in uh, Proverbs 16, 18. It warns us how that a gossip or a liar, lying person can separate chief friends or best of friends. Maybe you've seen that. Maybe you've experienced that. God forbid. Maybe you've been the victim of that. Where someone's lied about you and said things about you. And now all of a sudden there's this huge conflict be between you and someone that was a friend. And that's what gossip, that's what lying does. That's why this is so important that we obey this biblical principle when there's conflict, that we go directly to the person. We don't bring other people in that don't, don't need to be in. And again, there's times we do need to, right? Like there's times where maybe it's an unsafe situation or maybe, maybe it's a situation where you've tried and they haven't listened. Well, that's where Jesus says, then you go and you bring two or three witnesses. You have other people they get involved, but unfortunately, I think that we, that we often try to just immediately get all kinds of people on our side to hear our side, and and maybe it's times and people that don't even need to be involved in it. So we need to do it personally, but not just that. Secondly, in 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 restoring or dealing with conflict, resolving conflict, we need to do it humbly, right? So we're going to the person directly, and now we need to make sure we're approaching them in a humble 
manner. Doesn't mean you let people walk all over you. Doesn't mean you allow people to hurt you or abuse you. You can be firm, and sometimes you need to be firm, but you can do it in a humble manner. Why? Because when we're arrogant, what does that do? It just stirs up, it stirs up more conflict. It stirs up more drama when we approach something in an arrogant way. And that's what Proverbs tells us. In Proverbs 13, 10, it says, only by what? Pride comes contention. That's conflict. But with the well-advised is wisdom. So if, if pride and arrogance is what was the result of why we're in a conflict, if we have arrogance in trying to deal with it, it's not going to help. It's just going to, it's going to escalate it. So we need to approach people personally when there's a conflict and we need to do it with humility. We need to do it with humility, not a spirit of arrogance. And many times like that's, that's what happens. Like we do approach someone, but just our tone, like, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Cause people, they get that tone with you and you don't like it. They just have a little attitude in their approach and it's, it's arrogant. And you feel like, man, this is just, um, this is just escalating. It's making me more angry. <laughs> Why? Because pride is what causes that contention. So we can't approach it to resolve it with more pride. We need to have a humble spirit. Here's what Proverbs 15 one says. A soft answer. That's humility. It turns away wrath. But grievous words or angry words, what does that do? It stirs up more anger. It escalates. Have you seen that? Have you witnessed that? And you see like somebody gets angry and they're talking loud. And then what happens? The person they're talking to, they start talking even louder. And then it gets louder and louder and it, it escalates sometimes into violent situations. So it's a violent situation. Did you guys see that, that video? It went viral this last week of, it was like a 13U girls basketball league. Now I have a girl who's almost 13. She plays volleyball. She's passionate about it. And I'm passionate about it because I know she's passionate. I love watching her and it's fun. But let me just say this, 13 year old sports, like who, who really cares? Like how important is that? It's not that important. Well, this was apparently very important to some people. Because there was a situation that blew up in this game. And I think it's hard to tell exactly from the video. But the, the, the refs, I think, stopped the game. Because there was just a lot of conflict going on. And, and people getting angry. And it just got, it escalated. It escalated to the point of this. Where it ended with, with a fan running on the court. Grabbing the referee. And slamming him to the ground. Over a 13-year-old basketball game. Well, what do we see? We see this is exactly what Proverbs is talking about, right? When there's conflict and we approach it arrogantly and we get angry, it just escalates it instead of diffuses it. But I wonder, could a, just a humble, soft answer have diffused that? Maybe, maybe not, maybe not. And that's why, because they're evil People in the very angry, violent, evil people in the world, we do need to be prepared and equipped to defend ourselves and people who are vulnerable and weak to be able to stop evil, angry people from doing violence. But my point is this, that many times, not all the time, many times though, diffusing a situation by just acting in humility, not letting people hurt you or abuse you or walk all over you, but acting in humility would diffuse Many, many of the conflicts that come our way. And I just ask you to evaluate that if that's, if that's true in, in the conflicts maybe that you're in now or that you've been in. Just think about it. What if you would have just answered back in humility? What if it would have been a soft answer instead of harsh, angry words? Do you think it would have made a difference? Do you think maybe the conversation would have went a little better with your spouse? You think maybe with your, your kids instead of, again, I'm not saying you got to be their best friend. There's times you have to be firm, right? As parents, that's, that's what we're supposed to do. But do you think maybe if we would have answered a soft answer more, more with more humility than just immediately losing it with people that maybe the conversation would have went better? Maybe. We need to approach these Con, when it comes to conflict and resolving it, approach it personally, but then approach it in a humble spirit. 
humbly, not arrogantly. Thirdly, let's approach it unselfishly. Unselfishly. This goes hand in hand, I think, with, with humility. But, but not just immediately thinking, I've got to make them understand my point of view. Try to understand theirs first. Try to honestly see where, okay, where are they coming from? Maybe I'm wrong. And we'll talk about this as we conclude in just a moment about, about honestly evaluating things. That's important. But what if we sought to other people's needs above our own? I love this verse in, in Romans. I know we're getting out of Proverbs again, but I, I love this verse. This is in the context in Romans 12 about relationships within our church, right? Because Romans 12 is about, you know, about presenting our bodies, a sacrifice to God, and about the spiritual gifts, about being involved in our church and relationships within, within the church. And I love this verse. Romans 12, 10 says this. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. So it's saying being kind and showing love towards our brothers and sisters in Christ and honoring them by preferring one another. It, it, putting others above yourself. Just think about this. How many times would we just avoid conflict that doesn't even need to happen? Not, not avoiding it in the sense of we're running from it, but I mean, we just wouldn't start conflict if we would just follow this verse. If we would just, just in, in, in our life, and this is such an important principle in life, putting others' needs above our own, preferring other people, honoring our spouse, honoring our brothers and sisters in Christ, honoring people, respecting other people by looking at not just what's best for me, but what's best for them. And this is like one of those things that's so important in the life of, of, of a church. And I love our church and I love the, the unity we have in our church. And it's wonderful, right? But, but hey, we're, we're not above the fact that we're going to deal with conflict, right? Because we're human. We're going to have that. But just think about this. What if we, if we truly treated the relationships with one another about not what's just best for me, but what's best for everyone? And that's what happens most of the time in conflict in churches where, where people are angry at each other. People, most of the time, it's, it comes out of pride and selfishness. And look, we have to view things again, especially as, the, especially as our church continues to grow and we add more people to the church. It's an exciting thing. We want our church to feel like a family, but where there's always an extra place at the table for people to join us. Amen. We always want to be welcoming. Yes, we want to feel tight knit like we're a family, but always welcoming as people come to know Christ, as people walk in our doors. I hope people feel like they're welcome and part of, part of our family. Part of our family. That's so important. And as our church grows, here's what's important. That we have an attitude of what's best for everyone. You know, because sometimes it can be, well, what's best for me? With things like, you know, things that aren't even that important, like schedule change or different service times. I know we've joked about that and talked about that. But having an attitude where we're unselfish of not just, it's not always, well, what's best for me and my family? It's what's best for everyone? What's best for everyone? And just like as your family grows, you make adjustments, right? You make adjustments. You get a different vehicle and maybe a, a, a different schedule. Those have little ones. You know all about that different schedule. You make adjustments. Why? Because there's more people involved now. And the same thing's true within the church. As, as the church grows, as the pe God adds people to the church, we have to really have this attitude of unselfishness. Of unselfishness. To, to not create unnecessary conflict. And then when conflict comes in relationships, approach it in an unselfish way. Try to understand someone's viewpoint without demanding that they first understand yours. Now, yes, you do have to, it is important that they understand yours, but, but also let's be unselfish in trying to understand where they're coming from. Paul says this in Philippians just so beautifully. He says, look, don't look on your needs only. Look on the needs of others. Look on the needs of others and how beautiful that is when we see that lived out in the church. Amen. Where it's people who are looking at how can I meet other people's needs? And you guys are so wonderful at that because I see that all the time. I see people looking to sacrifice and jump in when someone has a need, when someone needs help. We're, we're there for each other. And that's how it should be. And I encourage us. Let's continue to have that unselfishness within the church. And then especially when it comes to conflict. When there's conflict, let's resolve it in an unselfish way. So let's do it personally. Let's do it humbly. Let's do it unselfishly. 
Another really, really important principle is this, that we do it honestly. We talked last week about how it's really important to have wise people in your life who are, who are um, not going, they're not going to flatter you with untruth. They're going to tell you the truth. Because let's just be honest, when there's a conflict, we can sometimes have blind spots. We can sometimes have blind spots. I mean, how many of you have been like so confident you were right about something and then like you realize later on like, oh, I was mistaken. I just, I was, I was really passionate and heated in the moment and I didn't really, I didn't really look at, at this with, with, with a true perspective. And, and let's just be honest, like when there is conflict or when we're angry, sometimes we can tend to not look at something honestly. And that's why it is important to have people in our life who are going to be true friends, who are going to speak honest, honesty with us. And, you know, and that's the thing, like if you have a conflict that's, you seem like it's not working out, I would really encourage you to, to find a brother or sister in Christ that you know and trust, you know, and, and it can be me. It doesn't have to be me, but, but you get someone involved to help with that conflict, because let's just be honest, when we're in the middle of conflict, we can tend to paint a picture that the person we're in conflict, conflict with is a villain and we're the victim. And sometimes that might be the case. Sometimes that's true, right? You were sinned against. You didn't do anything wrong. Somebody sinned against you. But I think there's times where we have blind spots to some shortcomings in our life. Some things in our life that, that we need to work on. And that's why it's important with conflict that we see it honestly. Because, again, it's easy to be deceived. It's easy to be deceived at times that we're hurting. Proverbs actually talks about this. And this is more in the context of being, um, of, of being that person who's involved in trying part of the solution, right? Someone that's a mediator. But it says it warns us about being quick to listen to the, the first person telling us the story. Proverbs 18, 17 warns us of that. Proverbs 18, 17, I think we have that verse. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searches them. In other words, like... Look, the, the, the first person that gives you the story will keep in mind. There's always another side. There's always another side. And again, sometimes it's the first story you hear is accurate. But a lot of times, a lot of times we can give our side, but we leave out some things. You ever had that? Where someone tells you something and they leave out one minor detail. Oh, but that minor detail actually changes quite a bit. And if we're honest, we've all been there maybe with, we're, we're quick to present our side, but there's some faults in our own side that we're not willing to see. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've experienced somebody where they just immediately, like anytime they have some, they hear someone, something that they don't like, they just completely shut it out. They don't want to hear it. It just triggers them. And then they're done. They don't hear anything else. And the danger with that is this, that we can be deceived. We can be deceived. So we need to make sure that we're approaching this honestly with a heart of humility and unselfishness and be willing to admit, you know what? Maybe I did something wrong and I need to ask you for forgiveness and apologize. Again, are there times where we're, we're a victim and we haven't done anything wrong? Of course, there are times like that. But I think there are times also where, where we do need to ask for forgiveness because there's been sin that we've done in a conflict. So we need to approach it humbly. But what happens though, what about the times we've done these things? I was talking to someone after the service this morning. And they said this, they said, I've done those things, but I have someone that won't forgive me. They won't forgive me. They won't even talk to me. They've written them. They've tried to communicate with them over a strained strain relationship. And they've, they've tried to resolve it biblically, but the person won't even hear them. And that can cause hurt. It can cause hurt when someone won't forgive you or someone who's hurt you will never apologize to you. They will never admit it. What do we do in those situations? How do we heal from that hurt? How do we heal from that hurt? Number one is this, don't deny it, right? Kind of along the lines of being open and honest. You don't have to say, you don't have to, to, to pretend like there wasn't a hurt there. You don't have to pretend like, you can be honest about it. And in fact, it'd be helpful to talk about it. Again, not in a gossiping way, 
but it can be helpful to express that, especially as you're talking to people that you that, that are that are gonna help walk wise people who are gonna help walk with you in life and point you to godly wisdom and counsel. Don't deny the hurt. Don't deny the hurt. Don't pretend like it's not there. Own that and deal with that. Again, whether that's hurt you've caused and someone won't forgive you, or vice versa, someone that's hurt you and will never apologize. They're not willing to even admit it. And maybe you try to bring it up and they just brush it off. Oh, nothing happened. Nothing happened. I'm okay. But you know, like, they're not okay, actually. You know, there's this wall up. Don't deny that, that that's there. Deal with the elephant in the room, right? Don't deny it. But then secondly, forgive. Or ask for forgiveness. Because maybe it's a case here where it's someone that you've hurt. Apologize. Repent from that. Don't try to cover it or deny it or diminish it or belittle it. Seek forgiveness. And if you've been hurt, be willing to forgive. Be willing to forgive. We talked yesterday. There was a group of about 15 of us men that met. And we, we talked about, um, about really it's about, about speaking blessing to the people in our life that are close to us. And writing letters of, of, of blessing and affirmation to the people close to us. Uh, to us, not just like for here and now, but for, you know, for generations to come that, that, that those people will have those letters that they know that'll make hopefully an impact for generations to come. And they were talking about this in the, um, the video uh, teaching that we were doing at the beginning of it about reconciling broken relationships and talked about how the power of a written letter can sometimes be that first step in healing or, or in restoring that relationship. And maybe for you, there's someone that you've hurt and maybe they won't talk to you. Maybe you've tried, maybe you haven't. Maybe it's writing them a letter as the first step. Maybe the next step's gonna be that you can meet face to face. But maybe for you today, that, that first step is writing a letter. Maybe it's someone that's hurt you. And maybe it needs to be a letter of forgiveness. And I don't know there's great controversy over this and, um, and I'll just be honest, I think it comes, it stems from us not understanding like what forgiveness really is and what it is not, right? We, we, we've talked about that often. In fact, in Ephesians, uh, a couple months ago, Ephesians 4, we talked about what forgiveness is not. Like it doesn't mean you allow evil and sin to happen to you. It doesn't mean that you can't seek justice, right? If someone rips you off 10 grand in a business deal, forgiveness doesn't mean you can't like pursue it and, you know, and, and make it right in a legal sense. But forgiveness means this. It means we're not going to allow that to destroy our life. That we're not going to harbor that anger and resentment and bitterness in our heart towards someone. And maybe there's someone you need to forgive. And maybe the hard thing is they'll never apologize. And maybe, honestly, it's not even safe for you to be around that person. But maybe it's you in your heart forgiving them. Because it's, it's more than just them. It's your heart. It's my heart. Are we willing to forgive? And then lastly, don't let it destroy your life now. Don't let that hurt from the past destroy your present right now. Because when that hurt, when that hurt is there... You know what? It's, it's, it's going to affect people around us. It's going to affect our loved ones. And, and I don't say that in a, like a, just an unsympathetic way of, oh, just get over it. No, no, it, it's true, true hurt. Maybe it's something, it's more than just someone saying something about you. Maybe it was like someone that abandoned you that you needed. Maybe it's someone that, that hurt you in a way that it just, it had lasting effects in, in your life. And I'm not making light of it and saying that it was no big deal. It's a huge deal. But you know what? I think too many people today, they're holding on to a hurt from, from, from years and years ago. And they're allowing that to destroy their life today. And some people, they want to they wanna blame every bad life decision that they've ever made and are making now on a hurt from years and years ago. And what I'm saying is, man, through, through the grace of God, that we are overcomers, amen? Like, we don't have to live defeated. We don't have to live with our, our, our present miserable and destroyed and our future ruined because of something that someone has done in the past. Forgive? Maybe it's not even possible to reconcile. But my question is this. Have we at least pursued that? 
Have we at least pursued that? Have we followed these biblical steps in resolving conflict and healing from past hurt? And I ask you this question today, honestly, like, is there someone right now that comes to your mind that you need to ask forgiveness or that you need to forgive? Maybe there's somebody specific God's place in your heart and mind. And I would just ask you to, to, to honestly look at that and pray about that, about what God's leading you to do in either one of those areas. And, and maybe it's not something like really specific right now or someone that maybe there's no one that you're harboring anger towards or bitterness. Maybe there's no one that you can think of that really hurts you. Again, all of us have had times we've been hurt, but maybe it's not something that really is weighing heavy on you. You've resolved it or tried to resolve it, but maybe these are just principles in life of being humble and unselfish and honest and going directly to people when there's an issue. Maybe God's speaking to you about that because that's, those are biblical principles that you haven't been practicing. And maybe that's something that we need to just start living and recognizing that, okay, God has given us these steps to resolve this conflict. And maybe we're not following that. And maybe today it's just a commitment that we're going to follow those things. We're going to follow God's way. We're going to follow what God has said.